Welcome to The Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is Seamless MD CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Dr. Douglas Slakey. Dr. Slakey is a healthcare professional and administrator with 30 years of experience in clinical and business leadership. He is highly committed to a patient-centric philosophy and is enthusiastic about discovering methods of collaborative healthcare ecosystems, whereby patient data and analysis enable various functions to communicate and conduct proactive treatment and care. Most recently, Dr. Slaghi served as Chief of Surgical Services at Advocate Aurora Health, where he led direction and strategic guidance in defining a vision for surgical services across 27 hospitals, articulating potential for growth in patient services and clinical training. In addition to his clinical responsibilities, Dr. Slakey focused on identifying and eliminating inefficiencies and incorporating ways to better adopt technologies such as advanced data analytics, AI, machine learning, and incorporating design thinking principles to optimize the patient experience. Dr. Slakey sits on the editorial boards of major medical journals and has authored over 150 peer-reviewed articles. He received his education at UC Berkeley and the Medical College of Wisconsin and completed his residency and fellowship training at the the Medical College of Wisconsin, University of Oxford, and Johns Hopkins. Dr. Slakey, Doug, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much to have it, having me here. I'm really excited about our discussion today. Honestly, Doug, we are so excited to have you on the show. You've led the absolute most fantastic career with a tremendous amount of success. I've heard actually you share in the past why you believe being well-rounded and having a broad interest over and above medicine allows one to relate in interdisciplinary ways with other people, places, and time, and especially the juxtaposition of how all of that interacts, which is why I believe your first degree was in history. And so where I really wanted to start the conversation was to understand, you know, what drew you to history in the first place and how do you view the intersection of history, medicine, and epidemiology? You know, it's such a fascinating milieu when we look at how healthcare is delivered. And, you know, fundamentally, healthcare affects every single person from obviously even before they're born to the day we die. And when you think about that, it's this human interaction, which at its core is so important in thinking about both individual and population health. So my love of history really I think goes back as far as I could remember. And actually, when I began college, I already knew I wanted to pursue a career in medicine, but I figured when else in my life could I actually study two different things? So although I went against some of the um, advice I received, you know, to focus on a science career, I really thought I could do the pre-medical studies and also do history at the same time. And One of the interesting things about history at the University of California, Berkeley, and schools like that is it's not really the focus on memorizing dates or or particular timelines. It's really thinking about how do people's environment, the socioeconomic realities of which they find themselves throughout time, relate to their life, their government choices, migration choices, even business and art are so inextricably intertwined. One of my hobbies over the last few years is collecting wine. And actually, when you think about the history of wine and food and human history, it it really is intertwined. I think with respect to a career in medicine, it's been a huge benefit to have a firm foundation in liberal arts, because if nothing else, It helps you relate to people as human beings, as individual people, not just as a diagnosis or a pathology or a particular disease entity you want to treat at the time. But but really putting that in perspective, I think, has helped me appreciate that. And then I will say, when I teach, I love to bring up some of the historical aspects of medicine, whether it's for medical students or residents, because... So much of what we do and where we're going in our profession relates to that historic context in in which things were discovered and how they were applied over time. Actually, Doug, I'd love to maybe double click on that a little bit. So I remember like in my, you know, medical training, 
we didn't get a lot of teaching on the history of medicine or, or the, the history of surgery. You know, we, we learn a lot about certain techniques, but we don't learn a lot about, you know, how that was developed, why it was developed, the mistakes made along the way. It sounds like that, that you tend to be more of an advocate for that. I'm curious, like any opinions on, are we doing enough? education in medicine on the history of medicine and if it's not enough like why should we maybe spend more time on that yeah i I, that's a that's really a great point i think you know there's a lot of aspects of medical training that over time sort of push each of us into what in reality is a very narrow lane and we tend to define ourselves very specifically like if i meet somebody new so what do you do? You're a surgeon. Oh, what kind of surgeon? And you become increasingly defined by that rather narrow pathway. I think the interesting thing about putting a historical context on top of that or layering in the educational paradigm is that it does allow the learner to really understand what were some of the limitations and how did innovation occur? And what may have stifled innovation and what might be stifling innovation today? And I I think, you know, it's fascinating, Joshua, because even when you think, for example, about our economics underpinning of the current way we deliver healthcare, there there is a clear historic pathway that brought us to the point we are today. And I think if you don't really understand the history of that, it's very, very difficult to conceive of anything beyond what we see today. And, and I, I think that's the most important thing. You know, there's the, the old adage that if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it, right? <laughs> and there's, there's some truth to that. But really, I think if we want to encourage the new generation of people going into healthcare to empower them to think differently, to think about new approaches, They really can't do that well if they don't understand how we got to where we are today. It's it's hard to see the differences. So I I think that's so important. And I also think there's, you know, some benefit from just understanding how certain techniques or strategies of care evolve over time and how they can be applied. And I just want to add one other thing that I think is really important. And we're probably going to get into my interest in, you know, socioeconomics and and, um, worldwide sort of cultural approaches to medicine. But I think getting back to my comment about you can't really appreciate people's perception of their own reality unless you understand the history of how they got there. And I think when we look at the globalization of healthcare, and even in our country, even in the United States or North America, clearly there are an ever increasing number of nuanced histories and realities of the people we treat. And if we don't appreciate their history and we don't appreciate how they really understand healthcare and their interaction with the healthcare system, that leads to the problems we face with disparities in care and, and unequal outcomes. And so, so I really think that all ties together. There's no simple way to, to really define it, but I think it's so important. And, and I'll just say one other thing is that, you know, the reality is when we interact with each other in the hospital or the clinic or whatever setting we're delivering healthcare, we have to not only appreciate our patients, but we have to appreciate each other. And clearly we've learned, or we should have learned at least, that a very hierarchical structure, sort of the old-fashioned structure where, you know, I'm a surgeon, so the surgeon sits at the top and everyone else is below them, those days, thankfully, are largely behind us, but it really does depend, the success of a flattened organizational structure does depend on on appreciating each other and, and understanding some of the more liberal arts aspects, the, the softer aspects of human relationships. That's awesome. I love that. Actually, it's fine. You mentioned earlier that, that old adage of if you don't study history, you're doomed to repeat it. I think another thought that comes to mind is often history does repeat. So unless you learn history, you won't be able to appreciate 
the cycles that happen, you know, globally and, and prepare for them. So um, that, that, I love that, that conversation, sure. Doug. I know one of the things we want to dig into is some of the other innovative work you've done in, in medical simulation. So maybe Al, I'll pass that, that topic sure. over to you. Yeah, well, you know, Doug, speaking of understanding history to implement new approaches to education and learning, you've really been a pioneer of some of these new approaches. Way back in 2010, while you were at Tulane, you co-founded the International Medical Simulation Learning Centers. And I believe it was to help educate healthcare teams on human factors, evidence-based knowledge, and simulation training to optimize outcomes and patient safety. I'm really curious, what was the genesis of these centers? How did that project start? Yeah. So the impetus for that really goes back to my experience working with teams to try to rebuild healthcare in New Orleans and the Gulf South after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And we really realized that to put the teams together and get them working efficiently when you maybe did not have all the resources you were accustomed to, the, the idea of building teams of teams and empowering them to work as independently as possible was critical. And as we evolved and we got through that, I, I was very fortunate to become connected with some high reliability experts in the petroleum industry and the airline industry. And I started to really think about how do they manage reliability over a career? And how do they adapt to new technology, you know, new aircraft, new systems? Because clearly you really can't do that efficiently if, if you just rely on your education through your professional degree. So through that work, I realized that, that these high reliability industries were really focused on things like crew resource management, simulation education, not just from a purely technical perspective, but from the perspective of situational awareness and how do you incorporate the resources that are available, which might include technology, might include other people, might include your knowledge. How do you incorporate that all together to be as efficient as possible? Well, then my research started branching out into thinking about how we could help improve some care, specifically end-stage renal disease up to and including transplantation. That's what we used as our model in emerging market countries. And there's really two approaches. The, the, the classic approach is for people from developed countries to do mission trips, which are wonderful, but they tend to be self-limited. Right, right, like you take a team, you might go for four or five days and you do a group of surgeries, but then you leave. And what's left? And I thought maybe when you think about the airline and the transportation industry, they're obviously global. And the reality is if you're a major airline, for example, what you're doing in Chicago at O'Hare might be different to some degree from what you're doing in Tokyo or what you're doing in Vietnam or other places. But fundamentally, the safety, the crew techniques, the training, they're replicated. They're environmental differences, but they're replicated. And so we thought, what if we could use that paradigm and start to train teams in emerging market countries to be able to take advantage of all the resources they had at hand. And we had some, I tell you, some really amazing results. And, and one of the exciting things was we were able to bring together experts from industry, both in the healthcare space, but also in the airline and transportation industry, physicians and surgeons and nurses. And we were able to do these longitudinal programs where we had amazing results. People were able to deliver more care with a high degree of value in, in some instances without increasing costs, just by increasing efficiency. And we even were able to expand services, for example, open a couple of kidney transplant centers where they didn't exist before and where nobody thought they could really exist. So it was a particularly exciting time. And fortunately, 
Uh, well, I took a little bit of a hiatus with COVID and things, but I'm really excited because I think the time probably is better than ever to reinstitute some of those philosophies and really think forward. How can we expand reliability and team training a, a, across a broad global spectrum of healthcare delivery? Doug, you, you've you been a, a huge advocate and leader in, in quality and safety and you know, I, I want to believe that now in the industry, in, in the healthcare system, the support for that movement is at an all-time high, but probably not quite where we all want it to be yet. I'm I'm wondering, um, in, in in your latest like time, um, championing that, what are the kind of the, the main barriers you're you're seeing today in the quality and safety movement? Like, I'm guessing part of it is change management. Maybe part of it is not enough payment reform. I'm not sure, but I'm curious how you think about the biggest challenges today in, in that movement. So it's, yeah, there, there are definitely challenges. I think on the, the one end of the spectrum, the payment models that currently exist are definitely a challenge. And what I mean by that is when we look, for example, at, at a fee-for-service payment model, the metrics that we use to define success might not incorporate safety and high reliability from a global perspective. One of the biggest challenges, Joshua, is that when we look at quality and safety and reliability over the umbrella that overlies an industry, the metrics that we use to define success have to be viewed from that continuum. And really, of course, in healthcare, it's the patient journey through the healthcare system, whether it's for a specific event like a joint replacement or whether it's more longitudinal over life. And because we tend to view productivity in our system at, at the individual point of delivery, the effect, the benefit of high reliability, quality, and safety sometimes isn't actually viewed throughout that continuum. We may, for example, have a, a certain technique that might be more effective than another, but if we do that and we apply that specific technique, one isolated budget might see an improvement, another isolated budget might see a detriment, and depending upon how that's viewed overall, it could cre create perverse incentives that might uh, diminish the effectiveness of quality and safety. The other thing that I think is so important, and, and we really, you know, I struggle with this a lot, honestly, is thinking about how we can provide the time and the resources for our healthcare providers and teams to have the life, true lifelong learning and that team training. So often we provide that training in ways which are not as effective as they might otherwise be. You know, one example is how often in surgery we talk about quality and safety at 6 or 6.30 in the morning before people are rushing to the operating room at 7.30. And so they're understandably distracted. They have competing priorities. And then the, the, the other thing that is a challenge is the true difficulty in having transparency of our data and accurately sharing our data, you know, because of a variety of conflicts, including our medical legal realities, especially in the emerging market countries in North America, we tend to not share data as openly as we might otherwise do so. And you can see that even in the reporting of for example, if we have a surgical device, like a stapler, and somebody has a leak, the reality is we almost never report that to the FDA. Now, really, we should, but we either blame the anastomotic leak on technical error of the user, the surgeon, or we blame it on the patient. We say the patient was too old or too weak or had bad tissue, you know, something like this. And th contrast that with the airline industry where there's really rigid reporting of even what we might think of as, as almost trivial problems with aircraft, but it's that aggregation of data and that transparency that at the end of the day contributes so much to safety. So I think those are really three areas 
where where we have to make some adjustments in, in the way we approach quality and safety and transparency. And, and Doug, I'm curious. I, I, I guess you know because I've talked to folks who you know we look at things like lean and we and we kind of try to compare it to you know how efficient Toyota has been, how safe their factories yeah. are, and all that kind of stuff. And I think one of the things that strikes me is humans are very complicated, especially in, in medicine. You know, one of the I guess one of the challenges is that. The human body is so complicated you know it's not like we're just making we're we're going through a factory of of the same vehicles that we're producing or, or fixing with humans every human is so different is that part of the complexity where no two humans are alike no two surgeries are the same yeah oh absolutely i think yeah you know i i certainly have thought a lot about lean and six sigma and those sort of linear approaches to optimizing efficiency and i i can't agree with you more they don't fit precisely with the way we deliver healthcare. And when you think about environments in which people work, they're, they're really sort of three categories, right? Like there's linear environments, which are very predictable and very, very deterministic, so akin to an assembly line. You're doing the same thing at every step exactly the same way, and the end product in the case of an automobile, we expect every one of those automobiles to be identical. And then there's complicated environments, but which probably relate a little bit more to healthcare, but they're still highly predictable. And you can use deterministic methods uh, to really define what are the probabilities of this or that occurring. And then there are complex environments where you have multiple autonomous but interdependent components. And I would say that's actually a more accurate representation of healthcare. Although, you know, we can try to find some normative behaviors, the reality is we have to empower the people taking care of patients to adapt to environmental and individual realities at the time they occur. I, you know, I could give you one example that I, that I use sometimes. We we have these risk calculators for surgery, which are are very linear. And so, for example, we all know that insulin dependent diabetes is a risk factor. So, if we actually use those risk calculators and we have a patient with diabetes, we check the box and we congratulate ourselves on checking that box. Not that we do anything with it, but we check the box. Well, what if I told you that I had Two patients that I saw in my clinic, exact same surgery, same age, both diabetic, both take the same amount of insulin, but one lives in a wealthy suburb with a very supportive family, and the other is a single person on public assistance with no car, no transportation. Even though we check the box, those two patients, common sense would tell us all as human beings that those two people have very different needs and that their risks are very different, and that really we can't apply a linear construct to those two patients. We have to say to ourselves, one patient needs a certain level of resource, and the other patient needs much different resources. And furthermore, to be really effective, we have to align those resources with need at the time the patient needs them. And that, you know, I think that's a great illustration of just how complex the decision making is. And if we just are too comfortable with a lean or six sigma type approach, we would treat those two patients as equal. And and they're not. They're not the same. They have different needs. And, and so if we really look at the outcome we want and we want them to have equal outcomes, we have to think, okay, well, how do we get both patients to that same point so that their outcomes are equivalent? That's really what's so important. Amazing, Doug. Maybe that, that's a great segue into I think some of the exciting work that that you've done recently at, at Advocate Aurora Health. So, you know, you spent 21 amazing years at Tulane and then you took on a new challenge in a leadership role at Advocate Aurora. And one of your big accomplishments was leading the surgical team approach to advanced recovery or the STAR initiative, which is, I think, was your version of, of enhanced recovery after surgery. And one of the amazing things that you did, I think, from a change management point of view, is you you rolled out ARAS to 13 surgical service lines and 130 plus surgeons in, in just 12 months. And some of the data I think we've, we've seen published has been 
you know, impacting 6,000 plus patients a year, length of stay down by 40%. We don't commonly hear about surgical programs rolling out complex QI initiatives like URAS to so many service lines in such a short period of time. Love to maybe unpack, like, what were some key strategies that you and your team used to kind of do that sort of, you know, really broad change management so quickly? Yeah, well, it was, it, believe me, when I first proposed this, it, it was not what everyone expected. Because as you pointed out, typically with enhanced recovery, you pick very defined service lines and you focus on that. And what really struck me was as, as I started thinking about this, I was going through the pre-op area and going through some of the surgery clinics and seeing how in these very specific small sub-segments of surgery they were using enhanced recovery, I realized that those patients stood out and everyone sort of almost put like a gold star on their charts. This is a special patient. This is an ERAS patient. And I had this, I think, a revelation. I said, you know, if we truly believe that this is the best care, why are the patients receiving the best care in a special category? It really should be the inverse. Patients not receiving STAR or enhanced recovery should be the ones that are in the minority. And they should be the ones to sort of raise a red flag and say, oh my gosh, this patient's not in enhanced recovery. We need to give them special attention. So that was sort of the light bulb going off in my head, as it were. And, and I thought about this and, and I thought about other, you know, things that have happened in the recent past in other industries, like the rapid adaption of Uber, the rapid adaption of the iPhone. And you even think, for example, going back to, you know, my experience with the airline industry, just think about how rapidly they rolled out the self-check-in on your smartphone, you know? And now, of course, you tag your bag in a lot of places yourself. They had no special training. They just rolled it out and they did it by fundamentally making it easier for people to do what they thought of as the right thing. And so that was really the key. I, I realized that if we were going to do this and change that paradigm and make STAR the norm, we had to make that the easier pathway. I think everybody delivering care, whether it's a nurse or a surgeon or a physician, they had the fundamental knowledge that it was better care, that it was more reliable. But if it's more difficult, people will not really take advantage of that. So instead of, and this was another key thing, Joshua, was, you know, we tend to, in healthcare, we tend to blame people for not doing something. We say, oh, we have to re-educate that group of people. They're not following orders. They're not following things. Well, really, when you think about human factors and you think about high reliability, again, if you're in a leadership role and you want people to adapt a certain behavior, make it the obvious pathway. Make it the pathway of least resistance. And so what we really did, I would say a threefold approach. One is at, at a core level, we made the order sets within the electronic health record very straightforward, very easy, and we provided enough resources to sometimes reluctant <laughs> surgeons and physicians to implement it and get it saved. We also put in the ability to collect data on the use of those order sets and, and, so, and to tie the use with outcomes because that's... You know, that reinforces behavior, obviously. It's kind of like a Pavlovian response. If you can show people that it's benefiting, it reinforces that behavior. And then the other thing we did was targeted education on an ongoing basis to really be sure that we could have everyone at a, at a base level of understanding the goals and the objectives to garner feedback for what were the limitations that people on the front lines were having. So really focusing on the process flow. Not just it's it's not just top down, but we wanted this to be generated. 
So we really gave people the tools where they could help refine the process so it worked for them. And that, you know, it just makes sense. That eliminated a lot of consternation and, and bias against the program. And then the, the, the other thing was we really realized that to be successful, this approach had to incorporate everybody involved in the team. We couldn't just focus on surgeons, for example which is a traditional pathway. So we made sure that we educated primary care, that we educated administration, that we educated nursing, and all of those involved so that there was really this collective enthusiasm for the process and collective support. And that makes a huge, huge difference. And I think we talked a, a little bit earlier, I mentioned this concept of team of teams, and that was really the way we, we structured this. So instead of top down, you will do this sort of edicts coming down from on high, <laughs> we really said that this is what we want to achieve. That this is how we're going to help you be part of the solution. And then we're going to have a back and forth dialogue. And, and really, I tell you, it was it, it was quite amazing. I was very optimistic. Others maybe weren't so optimistic, but it exceeded the adaption. Really exceeded everyone's expectations. It was very rapid. And then I'll just finish by saying it, it was fascinating. Within the the highest use areas of our organization, the highest use hospitals, my prediction of the non-star patients becoming sort of flagged as outside the norm actually occurred. So it was within six months and in, in some of these areas, it was a complete inverse where enhanced recovery used to be flagged as something special. Now that was the norm and patients who were not on enhanced recovery raised questions from the healthcare team. Why aren't they? And what can we do to help them get there? So yeah, really, really fascinating. And a lot of Again, getting back to the history, I think it's a, it's a lot of really behavioral science as opposed to a very strict approach to policies and procedures. You know, Doug, one of the things that, that strikes me and, and one of the concepts you, you mentioned was this idea of how do you reduce friction to, to folks doing the right thing for patients? Because you're, you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, I think a lot of folks in healthcare know what the right thing to do is, but when there's so much going on, there's so much mental energy being spent on, on taking care of your sickest patients or running around the, the hospital and, and doing other things. If you add more layers of friction to doing the right thing, it's going to get lost. I, I even think like just on a day-to-day -day basis, let's say, you know, where I am, I know that if, if you put, let's say junk food in front of me, right in front of me, yeah. there's very little friction to me kind of grabbing that junk food and eating it. But if you put it you know, all the way at the other end of the, the house, I, I'll be, I won't want to go all the way there to get it. And, and so it's, it's a great point around how do you make it easier for people to do, to do the right thing in healthcare? I do want to fault one question. Sorry, Al, we'll get back Sorry. to that after that's okay. <laughs> one of the challenges that, that I've found in, in quality is like, once you like launch an initiative, let's say it's successful, a lot of groups face challenges in sustaining success. And Enhanced Recovery is a good example. I've seen places where you get compliance to the protocol at a certain level, and then it just falls apart at some point. And one of the things I want to believe is that at some point, it's so successful, it becomes standard of care. You don't even have to call it enhanced recovery anymore because people are just doing, it's now normal perioperative care. But I'm wondering like, if you've ever come across challenges where it starts to fall apart and sustainment is hard, and, and why does that happen maybe? And then how do you, how do you prevent that? Yeah. I, I think that is an ongoing and inevitable challenge. When you think about it from one perspective, as you get better, people become very comfortable and honestly complacent with sort of the status quo. And you lose the focus on that continuous improvement. I think that's really, gosh, I love the term continuous quality improvement because that really is essential. You cannot let your eye off the ball. You have to keep focusing on that. So I definitely have had several times that, you know, disappointing to me 
where we've had great teams put together and COVID, I think, was sort of an enigma, obviously, but that that really curtailed many of the efforts because teams were reassigned. The reality is, even though these healthcare systems, some of them are so large, the margins compared to other industries are small. And the consequences of reducing the impetus or the focus on quality and reliability, again, you don't necessarily see that economically. And you don't necessarily see the results of diminishing efforts in that space for a long period of time. You know, it, it again, it gets back to our data reporting, right? Like, like we're always 24, 36 months behind in data. And so we tend to have this philosophy where, well, if it's good enough now, we'll just, uh, you know, let it go. And then, and then three years later or two years later, you start to say, oh gosh, we have to reinvest in this. So it, it is a challenge. It, it is a real challenge. And it's also the lack of continuous quality improvement, I think does relate to the historic norm of physicians and nurses to a large degree being trained to be very reliant on their individual experience and knowledge. Right. And this is a challenge because, you know, if, if, if that's the way we're training people, and so you finish your training and then you go on and you say, okay, well, I'm going to develop my expertise based upon what I've seen and what I've experienced. You and I could do the same exact roles in healthcare. We could do the same surgeries, but your patient population might be different than mine. There's a lot of randomness to what we see and what we experience. And so that leads to a real fundamental challenge in people appreciating, especially at the administrative level, appreciating that while individual knowledge and expertise is important, it's only as well, it's only as effective as the supporting environment which underlies it. And that's where administration has to take an active role in investing in people and resources to keep that quality and continuous quality improvement at the forefront of what we're doing. The other thing I'll just add in there, it, I alluded to it slightly, but in healthcare, we're, we, we've become very comfortable with recovery. This idea that, well, if we have an adverse event or we have an infection or a patient needs to be reoperated -oper on, we're good enough that we can usually manage that and save the patient's life, right? That's what we believe. So we focus on this idea of recovery as opposed to prevention. Okay. And then I'll just say that, again, in the fee-for-service model, sometimes that recovery might even be more highly reimbursing than the original procedure or care the patient was receiving. So again, there are some perverse incentives within our system that allow us to be comfortable with that paradigm. Right. Doug, you've mentioned in the conversation already your emphasis on process flow. And I want to dig in there a little bit. I know there's a, a study that was recently published that you authored around process flow disruptors and identifying these disruptions and process flow to really inform quality improvement efforts and initiatives. I'm curious, could you just share with our audience a little bit what is process flow and how are you using that to identify disruptions to process flow to inform QIA? Yeah, so process flow is is something that I've become just increasingly focused on and um, to get the teams to focus. So at the individual level, you can think of process flow as in sports or, or, or a highly technical thing. People might say being in the zone. And it's really at the individual level, ignoring distractions and focusing on the task at hand. From a broader system perspective, what process flow really allows us to consider is how do 
all of the different interdependent, but sometimes also independent components of healthcare delivery function together. And, and when you think about it, the way I like to think about it, at least, is to use the patient as the point of reference. So as the patient moves through a healthcare episode, how do they, how does that flow actually happen? Is it smooth? Are things aligned appropriately to optimize the patient's experience and outcome, or are they fragmented? And I think, unfortunately, we've all had a personal experience with how fragmented uh, the healthcare system is. So it's getting that alignment, I think at its core, it's aligning resources with need at the time the patient needs them. And also the key to optimizing process flow is anticipating what those needs will be. Sure. So again, moving from this paradigm of recovery as the highest measure of success to a paradigm where we say preventing adverse outcomes is the highest measure of success. And that's what we really want, is we want no adverse outcomes. We don't want those emergencies to arise in the middle of the night. We want to anticipate those. And so that's what we've really been uh, focused on a lot. It's, it's a very, I will say, it's quite challenging in a complex environment. But this is where you really, much like we did with enhanced recovery, you really have to appreciate how, what are the realities of all the different components of healthcare, all the people working within healthcare, what are their realities with respect to that patient flow? Where do they see challenges? Where do they see gaps? I, I can give you one you know, quick example, we did this analysis of blood sugar during surgery and after surgery. And we know that you should try to maintain blood sugar at, at a fairly normal level during surgery, whether they're longer or shorter. And of course, that's increasingly important as more and more of the population has some form of diabetes, right? Well, we learned that in some of our hospitals, the time it took for the anesthesiologist to write uh, during surgery to put in an order for insulin and to get it to the pharmacy and get the insulin was at least in their minds so long that for a normal case like a knee replacement they felt it wasn't worth checking the blood sugar because it would take too long to put the systems in place to treat it and so they would wait until the patient got to the recovery room. And so we noticed as we started increasing our measure and our data collection of intraoperative blood glucose, we noticed it was running higher than we liked in many patients. And it wasn't until we really analyzed the process flow that we identified this pharmacy issue. And we resolved that by asking the farm, asking the anesthesiologist, what would be the optimal resource for you during surgery? And how can you treat the patient more expeditiously? So we changed the whole system and really were able to impact the way that the anesthesiologist function. And again, it's getting back to that idea that instead of dictating to the anesthesiologist, you need to treat the glucose and putting penalties in place, we actually made it easier for them to do what they wanted to do anyway. So that became the normative behavior. And it's a very different approach. It sounds similar, but really from a leadership position, that's very different. It's empowering people to do the right thing and removing those barriers or flow disruptions that prevent them from accomplishing what they really want to do anyway. Yeah, it sounds like that's a common theme is really incentivizing the right action. And in doing so, you can identify these process flow disruptions and focus your efforts appropriately. That particular example, outcomes were improved tremendously after 
identifying that exact blood glucose process flow disruption. Doug, I'm really curious. A last question that I want to ask is more around data and understanding how we can use advanced analytics to possibly impact the future of healthcare. And going back to your earlier example about the two patients, both with diabetes, but from completely different areas, needing completely different resources. How do you see the role of advanced analytics impacting the social determinants of health and addressing those kind of issues? Yeah. So let me take a, a slight step back and say that, that, first of all, we have to acknowledge that all of us come to our daily work with bias. We either have confirmational bias or historic biases that impact our perceptions. So you have to acknowledge that as a reality. And when you think about what, can, how can we use advanced analytics, we can help resolve the individual biases to paint a more realistic picture that's not subjected to those individual biases. So that's, I, I think that's so important. We could talk for a whole hour on that yes. because it's an incredibly important topic. The second thing is that I think is being missed, honestly, by some of the, the larger electronic health record initiatives is that in my view, what we really need to do, getting back to that core idea of how do we empower people to do the right thing, what we really want to do is not just identify, use advanced analytics to identify things that are reality. What we want to do is use advanced analytics to suggest or implement treatment paradigms that are customized to the individual patient. So let's use Waze as an example, okay. right? We all use Google Maps or Waze now. And it tells us there's a car on the side of the road ahead, or there's a slowdown, an alternate route is suggested. It doesn't force us to use that alternate route. It suggests it. And I think that's really important for healthcare workers to understand is you're not trying to force people into some paradigm, but what you want to do is make it easy and suggest what might be the optimal. So let's take those two patients that are both diabetic that are going for surgery. Well, the one patient has no car, no transportation. So it'd probably be good to try to supply them transportation, get a social work consult. Some hospitals have Uber vouchers and things, but you want to do that up front, right? You, and you don't want the, the busy, busy frontline provider to have to constantly be thinking about that. So wouldn't it be fantastic if we had a system that assimilated all that data, understood what screens being proposed, and then provided a list of those resources that could be automatically implemented. And that's so different. What we do today is we might have a flag that says, you know, patient at risk for transportation, lack of transportation, but that's where it stops. And we don't go beyond that. We don't go to the point of providing people the tools that they need to make a difference, to help them out, right? That's really where I see advanced analytics becoming incredibly powerful and providing those tools. Another example would be if we had a couple of patients that had back pain and advanced analytics could look at the x-ray results, they could look at the patient history, they could look at opioid dependency, other resources, and then suggest a course of physical therapy, maybe weight loss, perhaps, or surgery if it was really predicted to be the best result. And when you think about that, wouldn't that be fabulous? Because then the patient would tend to be optimized in their referral through the healthcare system. You wouldn't waste time. And even if you could identify those patients in this example that were predicted to do better with surgery, it would improve the efficiency of the surgery clinic because you knew 
that your intake mechanism was pre-screening patients. So the ones you were seeing as a surgeon were those who were most likely predicted to be successfully treated with surgery at an earlier time. So those are the kind of things that I, I'm particularly excited about the future because I, I think we're, we're very close to these sort of constructs becoming reality. And again, it's not removing the doctor-patient relationship, but I think, honestly, if we really focus on that relationship as important, we're strengthening that relationship because we're providing more tools and more resources to make that patient journey as smooth and predictable and the outcomes as reliable as possible. I think, Doug, one of the things that you your, your comments remind me of is, you know, I think in the past there used to be this this fear or, or controversy around, you know, will AI replace physicians? But I think what we're starting to find out is that's probably not the case. More likely, physicians who are, are open and willing to leverage AI to assist them may replace the physicians who are not willing to change and take advantage of new tools. Uh, great, yeah, great. Well, yeah. Well, and, and the other thing, you know, I, I mean, that's such a good point. And the other thing, getting back to that comment I made about the historic norm of a physician going through their career and basing their expertise on what they've experienced, with AI and advanced analytics, and if we really are transparent and we're sharing with data, the physician really benefits, or the caregiver, whatever the role is, really benefits from a much broader aggregation of population level data. And not only at the population, but then we get targeted with ads and things now when we're on social media or whatever. But you know, you can look at the realities of what patients, their socioeconomic factors, their living factors, their support network or lack thereof. And, and we can really bring that knowledge to bear to improve value in the way we deliver care. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Alan. I think <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say, you know, <laughs> it really ties everything together with what you've been saying throughout this whole conversation around the need for transparent reporting, because then we can get these insights into the data and, and understand how we can use it to accommodate different patients from a wide variety of historical backgrounds. And so I think it's, you know, such an insightful thread that you've weaved throughout this conversation. And honestly, it's, it's been great. Doug, being mindful of your time, let's flip over to what we call the fast five lightning round. It's just five rapid fire questions for you. The first question that we have is what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? Well, I have to put that in a couple of categories. So from a business perspective, I have two. One is uh, the one at the top of my list would be Multipliers by Liz Weissman. It's a great book. And I, I think it's really resonated with me because it, it really focuses on the point that some of the most successful, strongest leaders and managers are those that help others to achieve success, kind of coaching. You know, that's the, that's the epitome of coaching. And, and I think that's where, honestly, I've gotten my greatest uh, joy. I'll say one other book that I did gift to a couple people recently with the holidays was The Oneness Versus the 1% yeah. by Vandana Shiva, which I read and uh, was a real eye-opener for yeah. me <laughs> about globalism and uh, agriculture and the economy. So... Um, for slightly different audiences, uh -huh. but both are, were fantastic, the books that I've read recently. That's awesome. Question two that we have, who is a person either dead or alive who you'd love to meet? Yeah, I think I'd have, at the top of my list would be Thomas Jefferson. Uh -huh. I just think that he, you know, my specialty in study of history was colonial American history. And he just stands out as, a scholar, a renaissance person, an inventor, just somebody who really was incredibly interesting. And I, I just, you know, couldn't imagine how the conversation would go if we sat around sure. the table. And I know he liked wine like I do over yeah. glass <laughs> and, and talk about 
issues. I think it would be amazing. It's fantastic. Three is a bit different. Would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. I think reading people's minds. Yeah. Sometimes I, I will tell you as much as I try to be a humanist and, and understand other people's perspectives, sometimes I'm just uh, I'm I'm just left w without being able to <laughs> really understand where some people are coming from. So so that would definitely be the super strength I would want. That's awesome. Question four: What is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane? Oh, I, I think I, I think some of the perversity of our payment mechanisms is really something. I used to give an ethics talk about transplant and. Um, uh, the way a lot of the contracts work is once the organ is reperfused, that's really the trigger for a uh, payment for the transplant. So as ironic as it seems from an economic perspective, if the patient dies right after you do the transplant, your overall profitability is, is potentially highest. Wow. And, and so it's things like that. When, when you talk to audiences and, and you talk about the ethics of that, it really leaves people rather stunned and uh, you say, oh, wow, why are we doing, <laughs> why are we doing this? Wow. Yeah. I did not know that. That is <laughs> fascinating. Last question that we have, Doug, if you could travel, I, I, I'm so curious about your answer here. If we could travel back in time to any event or moment, what would it be and why? Yeah. I, you know, that was, that was a really hard uh, question for me as I thought through that. I, I honestly think one of the things I would love to see would be the famous Chicago World's Fair, where there were so many technologic innovations, um, you know, from, from the Ferris wheel to food, like, like the okay. hot dog and different things that were presented at that World's Fair. It's always just amazed me how large those fairs were, given the, the challenges with transportation. <laughs> and how much they influence the dissemination of technology and innovation and, and even social change. So I, I would love to go back and see, it, it sort of relates to my time in, uh, in Chicago the last five years. That would be something I would love to experience. Uh -huh. No, that's awesome, yeah. Complete dissemination of culture, it's so cool. Uh -huh. Well, Doug, I wanna say thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. For folks listening, you can find Doug on Twitter at Doug Slakey. Uh, and that's a wrap for this episode of The Digital Patient hosted by Seamless MD. You can follow us on Twitter at Seamless MD. And if you like the podcast and you want to learn more, visit www.seamless.md. Uh, Doug, again, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Alan and Joshua. Really appreciated the conversation. Thanks so much, Doug. Mm -hmm.